Well, Happy New Year, Rock of Roseville. Again, excited for what's ahead. We begin a new series today called Reset. How many of us need a reset in some areas of our life? So we're going to be using a book kind of as a guide for us over this next uh, eight weeks here. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry uh, by a great guy named John Mark Comer. Uh, our team has read this. It's been fantastic. I'll kind of be using it as a, uh, as a little bit of an outline today and then some personal things that we've kind of developed from this uh, particular focus that we believe God's called us to. We're really, our main topic today is hurry is the enemy of holiness in our life. And when you are victim to hurry and busyness, we really can't make room for what God wants to do and mature and grow in our life. And uh, again, I have some things prepared, but I wanted to share one more time what I was feeling this morning. I heard a couple different words. The first word was, as I was walking downstairs today, I just heard the Lord say, unprecedented growth. And I really feel for a lot of you here in this season, you have had a lot of years of lack, a lot of years of staleness and dry soil, but there's an invitation for a bumper crop year in your life of growth, of maturity, of breakthrough that God's inviting us into, but there's going to take some heart cultivation that will take place, and one of the keys to that is this verse I mentioned a minute ago, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of Christ Jesus our Lord. There's an invitation that God is speaking to our church in this season. Uh, I've seen many of us respond to that. I'm excited for the mission that God has, all that he's developing in us. And part of that spirit sensitivity is not knowing where God is clearly taking us this year in regards to the missional opportunities. As we're praying, as many of you gave uh, generously towards our community center, we're excited to see what happens there. We're getting our final numbers in. Should be able to share them next week. But just pray for vision and clarity as God gives us this, this clear idea of 2020, that vision is the opportunity opportunity for our lives and for our church to really see the plans of God's heart come to maturity. Uh, one of the things we had thought we had clarity on was uh, some missional opportunities in Iraq, and uh, Pastor Bob was set out to go next week again for what God was open up, uh, but uh, he had a little bit of a, of a U-turn take place. Welcome Pastor Bob real quick as he shares as we get to pray for just one minute. Yeah, so... You know, uh, Robbie and I went uh, a few weeks ago and just felt a connection to go over there and do something. And so we went and uh, we saw, you know, refugees. We went in their tents. Uh, we heard their stories. Uh, we brought some supplies and a lot of different things, prayed for a lot of people. And it was, and it was awesome. And so, you know, th the problem is when you have a connection with someone uh, or a nation, then you have a responsibility on some level. And so, you know, for me, I just felt like, okay, uh, I've been there. I've seen what I'm supposed to see. Uh, we have a responsibility. I'm supposed to go back. So uh, I was getting ready to buy the ticket to go a week from tomorrow, and uh, I felt the Lord just say, wait, wait. I don't like that word. That's not one of my favorite words, but wait. It's like, last name's Hasty. You know, I got a problem. Um, so wait, wait. And so I, I, was, I thought, okay, I waited a day, so I was getting ready to buy the tickets. Wait, wait. And then, you know, all hell broke loose over there. So um, they're not letting Americans in. So, and I'm, I can't disguise myself. So, um, anyways, would you stand up real quick? Let's pray for Iraq. As, as we were talking about this, I was talking to Pastor Brandon this morning. I have a friend over there right now, uh, and he's a fearless uh, missionary. He's not afraid. So, uh, I want to pray for him. But I, I was thinking of the words that Jesus said in the last days nation will rise up against nation. And when he said that, he didn't say, sit back and watch it. You know, so I want to pray, Jesus becomes the desire of the nations. So, Father, right now, we extend our hands and our hearts towards Iraq, uh, a place that really wasn't on my grid. It wasn't on uh, the map for me at all, only just kind of in name. But yet, for some reason, you opened the door for, for me to go and for us to go and provide and extend Jesus' heart and hands and provisions to some of those people. And so right now, God, in the midst of all that chaos, I pray that the Prince of Peace would wade through every conflict right now, that Jesus would would be highlighted and illuminated, would become the desire of the nation of Iraq and the Kurdish people, God. I pray, I pray to that storm right now, and I pray cease and desist. Peace be still. God, and for the, uh, for the missionaries that are there scattered throughout that land, I pray that you would give them courage, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them foresight, God, that you would give them discernment on who to share with, 
uh, when to share, how to share it, God. And so we pray your kingdom come, your will be done to all the places that we went, all the places that conflict is breaking out right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would put on all of our hearts at different times to pray for that nation, God, because we have a connection and we have a responsibility. And I pray your will be done right now in that place with those people in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Come on, give it up for Pastor Bob. No, I'm excited for what's ahead. Just even seeing just the unprecedented opportunity that's coming our way with our community center, with the community groups here, with what God's doing through our missions teams in Haiti and China and Iraq. So today at the end, we're actually going to have our our Chinese missionaries uh, come up. They're not Chinese. Well, one is now. Uh, American missionaries in China. Uh, and that uh, just going to share kind of what God's doing in regards to the mission over there. But again, church, let's continue to pray and believe. Uh, I, I'm really feeling this acceleration in just the capital C church as things in our culture get crazier and crazier. I had to have some very candid conversations with other leaders in our city and other churches and, and, and hard conversations about what does unity actually look like practically, not just in word, but in deed. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a difficult one. I leveraged some relationship, uh, but got an email yesterday that things were well received in the end. And really seeing progress in the region take place, continue to pray for that. Uh, I'm excited for what's there. I had two other leaders approach me uh, recently. We've been praying about this for a while. Uh, looks like they're going to be starting house churches by the end of the year uh, locally here, help through us. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. These visions are starting to form and take place in, in time frames we did not anticipate. Um, so God's preparing us for an outpouring. Our, our friend Joanne Moody shared with me the other day, uh, she said the Lord gave her words word, said, mend the nets, prepare the nets. And I really feel that's for us in our life, resetting, getting things in right place so that we can receive the harvest that God has up ahead. Uh, do me a favor, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. This will be our anchor verse for the series. I'll go through the uh, beginning verse today, and then we'll uh, reference these other verses uh, throughout the series here. So Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. I know there's a few different translations people use, but bear with me with uh, this translation here. It says this, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your leadership this morning. Make your word alive. Lord, we thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That it's living, it's breathing, it's active. Would you come and revive our dead hearts this morning? Our hearts have become dull. They've become oversaturated. Let's get this picture of of a sponge that has way too much water in it. Holy Spirit, we invite your hand to squeeze it out, Lord. We invite your hand to grab a hold of our hearts in a way that gets our attention. Lord, we're asking for this new year not just to be the same old thing. We make promises that never materialize. We set up for change that never actually happens. God, let this be a year of tremendous transformation. We're believing for it, God, in our personal lives. Lord, we're asking for those as we pray this morning. Areas where we need miracles. God, show up. God, would you meet us in the widow's house where there's no grain and there's no oil? God, would you meet us in the house where our son is sick and dying and the fever is set in? God, would you meet us in the house where we've had the issue of blood for over 12 years? God, would you show up in this church family's life? We pray for the 800 homes that surround this building. God, we're asking that you would come and reach those families in a real and tangible way. Lord, would you send out this community, this body, like missionaries into their neighborhoods. Lord, we pray this year we would see more dinners in our houses with neighbors whose names we did not know than we've ever seen. God, this would be a year where we see breakthrough with bosses that have just been awful bosses. Lord, Lord, you've placed us in certain business environments to be witnesses. And just, again, feel the prompting right now, eyes closed. You're in a place where your boss has really been difficult to work with, and you need grace in that relationship. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Ryan and Bob, you can put your hand down. Don't, Don't lift your hand up. No, if that's you, you need grace for your boss practically. Lift your hand up if that's you right now. Father, we just ask, Holy Spirit, for grace to love, grace to care. 
the misscheduling that's consistent, the promised overtime that never happens. God, would you provide in ways that are unexpected, but they would fulfill the mission and assignment that you have for them in this season. So Holy Spirit, would you help us to hear your word this morning, to receive from your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. amen. To the person next to you, get ready for something good. Get ready for something. So without fail, every year, this phrase starts to emerge. I, I just look for it. I wait right after Thanksgiving. You'll start to hear the advertisements. You'll see the commercials. A phrase we're all familiar with. I've talked about this before. New year, new you. All the time. Without fail, it shows up on a Jenny Craig commercial, on a Weight Watchers commercial, on an internet advertisement. You'll see this phrase over and over again. And what we all do is we get on this rat race called New Year's resolutions. We get on this, this wheel, this cycle where we know change needs to happen. But unfortunately, as they've studied New Year's resolutions, they've come to determine and understand that most people don't fulfill them. And actually, the percentage is far worse than you would ever guess. Here's what one journalist writes. A little more than half of Americans make New Year's resolutions, but only 8% of those that make them actually succeed at meeting their goals. So not 5 out of 10. We're talking about 8 people out of 100 are actually successful at these changes and these resolutions that they want to make. Now, when we immediately hear that, we think, well, obviously, these changes were really vain changes they wanted to see take place. They're obviously not really good things, because if it was a good thing they were after, maybe it would be accomplished. Here's the list of the top 10 resolutions that are often broken. Here we go. Number one, lose weight and get fit. Already, I can feel it. Just even saying it out of my mouth. You set up January 1. I was at the gym, and I was like, where's the crowd? And I went to the, uh, to the person at the, uh, the child care center. They're like, oh, wait, wait for January 2nd. Sure enough, same attendance. Man, you gave up on day one, some of you. Anyways, we, we get fit, lose weight, quit smoking, learn something new. I don't know how this one is not fulfilled. That's a pretty sad lack of fulfillment. <laughs> Eat healthier. I get that. Get out of debt. Save money. Spend more time with family. Again, how do we not make room for the things that are important like this? Less stress. That one's probably unrealistic. Drink less. Quit smoking. Travel to a new place. Volunteer. See, these are, these are good changes we all want to make. So why then don't we fulfill these changes we set out to make? Why don't we see success in the changes we know we need? Our entire culture is telling us there's something that needs to change in their life, but it's deeper than the, sub, the symptoms that many of us are living in. And what they've learned to find out is this, is that actually when we make these resolutions, we're making promises to a future self, a future person that we don't know. Here's what they say. It turns out that we see our future selves as strangers. The people we become in a decade or more are unknown to us. That bright, shining New Year's resolution, if you feel perfectly justified in breaking it, it may be because it feels like that promise was made to someone else. So when they look at our minds and they study them, they ask us these questions. Whenever they talk about your present self, your brain lights up in a certain way. When you talk about your future self, it's like you're referencing a celebrity you've never met before. Literally, your, your brain sends these signals that this is a foreign person you're talking to. And what ends up happening is we arrive at a future failed version of ourselves. Eventually, that day comes when those decisions and life choices we've made end up at a wedding where our kids don't want to invite us. They end up sick Disease because of habits we never let go of. They end up in dissolved relationships. We have to come to terms that maybe we're not needing just a resolution in our life. Maybe it's just not the resolution of the slight changes that we're needing to make. And as I was praying about this word this week, and I said, Lord, I don't want something cheesy. You know, you don't need resolution, you need revival. No, that wasn't what I needed. But I did hear the Lord say this. The culture's longing not for resolution, but they need resurrection. There's a new life that Jesus wants to produce in us that only he can fulfill. 
There's a new life, that from the dead. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is this aim, this object that the culture is left wanting in. And we have to come to recognize that this pursuit of self has left the culture emptier than it's ever been before. We're falling prey to the parable that Jesus warned us about in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Take note of this. For those who try and find their life will lose it. Again, vague words that are hard to understand but deeply profound. Now, this word find literally means to discover, to come to conclusion intellectually through reflection, observation, and examination. Now, we've been in this epidemic in culture to what? Self-discovery. We've been in this epidemic and culture to find one's self. And now the word that Matthew uses for life in this particular verse is not the common word that you'll find throughout most of the New Testament. Whenever you hear Paul reference life or even the Gospel of John, when Jesus references life, it's this Greek word zoe. So it's this abundant, fruitful life, this, this teeming, but, you know, really growth-based life. But the word that Matthew chooses to use here is very telling. The word he uses for life is the word psyche, the Greek word psyche, which means soul. Those that try and find their souls in the end will lose it. They'll be left wanting. Now, the word soul is incredibly deep. And for many of us that use it just on occasion, we miss its depth. This is what the word means in the Greek. It's the seat and center of the inner human life. Your soul is the very essence and personhood of who you are. What Jesus warns us of is this. If you try and seek your own soul, you'll be lost in the end. Your soul was never intended to be a navigation system. Your soul was never intended to be its own destination. You can't arrive at yourself. You'll be left wanting. And what John Mark Comer writes about is he says this. He says most of the the epidemic in our culture is people that are trying to strive to become something, but this is the symptoms they're living in. He writes, I feel like a ghost, half alive, half dead, more numb than anything else, flat, one-dimensional. Emotionally, I live with the undercurrent of a nonstop anxiety that rarely goes away. A tinge of sadness, but mostly I just feel blah, spiritually empty. It's like my soul is hollow. If you really get beneath the surface, under the skin of culture, it's how many feel. And this has been the result. This has been the end game of this search for self, this discovery of self. But that soul was never intended to be the navigation system or the destination. I remember several years ago, I was invited to a friend's beach house for New Year's. It was over in Sea Ranch. Has anybody ever been to Sea Ranch before? Beautiful place, but it's one of those places that takes a long time to get there and lots of small roads to finally arrive. So we went. It was me and four other friends. Before I was married, and we're in this car, and everybody's a leader. Everybody is a leader at some type of church, so you always come prepared. So as I get there, I ask the person that's driving, I said, hey, did you bring a map? And she says, no, my grandmother gave me a GPS navigation system. Now, back in my day, before there were cell phones that you can use to navigate where you went, we had these Garmin GPS systems. Anybody remember those? Here's what they look like back in my day, right? Here we go. Do we have a picture of the uh, the GPS system? So we had this system. Now, it wasn't like the technology we have today where you could literally speak your destination to place and it would give you options and detours and Starbucks along the way. There was no Starbucks like that then. You had to manually type them in and at times you'd have to scroll through the letters. You remember that? You have to scroll through the letters like a Rolodex to find these destinations and they had to be exact. You could not be off by one number or a misspelled place. You would end up in the wrong place by the end. Well, as we're driving to this particular destination we're set off to go to, as we're driving, we recognize there was a storm a few days prior. And we left later than we should have. How many know off in that situation when you go traveling with other people? And we, uh, we leave later than we planned. It gets really dark, and this detour starts to form up. 
So again, this is an old school GPS. It doesn't have rerouting technology. So we're trying to navigate on these roads. We're thinking, okay, at least it's going to navigate it like a map. Well, it turns out it gets so dark and so foggy as we're driving, the GPS system has not been able to identify the coordinates, and we start driving into blackness on the GPS system. The map disappears. So we don't know where we're going, and everybody's anxious. You know, the person in the car gets all hot, like, I'm super hot, open the windows, but then you have the person next to you that's cold, and it just becomes really stressful and tense. We don't know where we're going. I said, don't worry, I've prepared. I had printed the trustworthy and faithful MapQuest. <laughs> MapQuest came in clutch in this moment because I did the thing that many of us chose to not do, is I actually printed that last page that gave you the map overview. You know what I'm talking about? So we were able to navigate because of this incredibly digitized MapQuest that we had printed out. You see, there is these, this need in us where our own navigation system will always be left wanting. We're in need of a greater guide, of a better map. And the better guide, the better map, his name is Jesus. The direction you're longing to get to, the place you're longing to go can only be found in him. And this is what I think brilliantly says in the message about the same verse we just read. If you forget about yourself, and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. See, we need to forget about this self-absorbed life that our culture is profiting from. This self-absorbed life that in the end will always be left wanting. And we need to look to the one that can finally recreate and resurrect the new life that can only be found in him. He's the destination. He's the arrival point. You see, what Matthew does brilliantly is is his focus of discipleship and the journey of believers is so beautiful. He starts to write to a primarily Jewish community that was familiar with a lot of the Jewish customs. They were familiar with what they call the Jewish writings. And what we don't often understand is that their text was beyond just the Old Testament that many of us hold today. They had these other writings that they would hold to and these extra biblical laws that the Pharisees started to develop. So when Matthew gives this invitation to a new life following the very next chapter in the same discord, he says, you'll find your life, you'll lose it, but lose it for my sake, you'll find it. He then crescendos with this call in Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all that are weary and burdened, and you'll find rest for your souls. See, his invitation is not just left in, if you find your life, you'll lose it, lose it for my sake, you'll find it. He says, you first got to come to me. I'm inviting you into discipleship. Now, when we often hear this phrase, come to me or follow me throughout the New Testament, in particular the book of Matthew, this is a general invitation that Jesus is giving. This is the first invitation we actually see that's beyond his small group of disciples. This is an invitation to the masses that are following him. It says, come to me, all that are wearied and burdened. Now, on the surface, this is a profound verse, but really, Matthew does some incredible jujitsu to the text here. And what we notice is this, is, is in his master samurai way, Matthew weaves in two very well-known revelations of God in this one verse. See, there was another writing that many would know and be familiar with that Matthew references here and Jesus brilliantly references in his invitation. There was this writing called Syrach or Sirach, and it was the writings of wisdom. It came out in the year 200 B.C., And in this incredibly long letter that was written by one of these, they believe, messianic claimants, this historian, he writes about wisdom. And now wisdom held the chief place before Yahweh. Wisdom was the intermediary between Yahweh and his people, is what they believed. And here's what it says. This is Sirach, chapter 51. It says this, Draw near to me, You who are uneducated and lodge in the house of instruction and put your neck under my yoke and let your souls receive instruction. 
See, they understood that wisdom that is speaking here is calling out for others to come to her to receive instruction and to receive rest for their soul to receive peace in their soul. Now, what Matthew also does brilliantly through Jesus' declaration here is he references a rest that only Yahweh can bring. And what we find is the same phrase borrowed from Exodus chapter 33 when Moses has this revelation of Yahweh before him, and he says this, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So what Jesus does is he literally says, I am wisdom in the flesh and I'm Yahweh in your presence. This is an incredible deity claim. So many people will read the scriptures and say, oh, Jesus never really says he's God. Yes, he does. And it's very clear. We are just so removed from the culture, we miss the invitations into his worship. And he says, listen, come and receive instruction Let's remove the heavy burden from your shoulders that you've been carrying. I am wisdom for you. We have to understand that Jesus' teachings are not just eloquent sayings that we put on t-shirts and bumper stickers. He is wisdom magnified. And the life after Jesus is a wise life, not a foolish life. See, Paul would talk about this all the time. You know, the cross is foolishness to the world, but wisdom to us. And many of us, see, we follow Jesus, that we're Christians, that we adopt his teachings, but we kind of just keep them on the side like something we do on Sunday and when we have time to abide in them. That's not the invitation Jesus is giving. He says, come under my instruction. Come under my yoke. We'll talk about that word yoke in a couple weeks here. But he invites us in to the true rest that only his presence can bring. Now, in order for us to live inside of this rest, we have to learn to eliminate hurry in our life. Now, hurry and busyness are two massive subject matters in our culture. All of us would say they're busy. You ask somebody the other week, right? How are you doing? Oh, it's been a busy week. Very rarely do I have someone say, man, this week, so slow, didn't know what to do with my time. <laughs> so bored. I, had, I literally had to find things to do. No one here, unless if you're a very young millennial, would say that. I'm a millennial. I could say that to you. No, what we have to understand is that our life will get filled. Your time is this vacuum that sucks things into its orbit. And we have to learn to understand that the enemy doesn't come at us like the traditional ways of sin that we normally would fall prey to. If you're mature in your life, we'll talk about this in a minute, mature in your life, you've learned to set boundaries in those major areas of sin. Sin often shows up like hurry and busyness. Here's what the book says. Hurry is the root problem underneath the symptoms of toxicity in our world. Satan doesn't show up with a pitchfork and fire. He is far more likely to show up in the form of an alert on your phone while you're reading your Bible, a multi-day Netflix binge, a full dopamine addiction to Instagram, or commitment after commitment, catch this phrase, in a life of speed. We have fast lives. People are too busy to live emotionally healthy, spiritually rich lives and vibrant lives. The need of the hour is slow down spirituality. See, when God shows up, he shows up suddenly. But as Pastor Bob has brilliantly said time and time again, Jesus always walked to those miracles. We have to learn to adopt his pace, to adopt his way of life. How do we follow after Jesus? How do we eliminate hurry and busyness that often interrupt the holiness that God wants to produce. We don't have time for holiness to mature in our life, to look like him, to feel his presence. I had one counselor tell me one time they would, they would meet with these international students and the international students would say, how is it that when I go to my country and I meet a Buddhist monk or a Hindu teacher, they feel more like holy men, but when I meet your pastors, they look and feel like businessmen. Church, when your friends see your life, do they see the holiness of Jesus or the busyness and hurry 
and hustle of our world. What do they see? Let's put the mirror back on us. We have to live the life of Jesus. When people see us, they recognize the peace of God. That was the number one quality when the disciples walked into a house was they were to leave the shalom of God in that place. When your friends see you, are they more stressed out or at rest when they're in your presence? It's a good indicator. Are you living in so much anxiety that you can't even release the peace of Jesus in the houses you've entered in because there's no rest in your own soul? It's a journey. We all get stressed out, but this is the invitation. This is why we need to be aggressive in this. Now, the, uh, the common question I get is, how do you make this practical? Theory's great. How do we make this practical? I think today we'll end with this major parable here. See, I think the way that we can make rest practical and living under the yoke of Jesus practical is found in a parable many of us have heard before, but I think there's two, two areas we tend to overlook. It's Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the soils. Now, in the parable of the soils, we have these four soils, and what we tend to focus on in Christianity is the context of evangelism, the context of sowing seed, and there's two primary soils that we pay attention to. The first soil is the hard soil, where the seed falls on the ground, and then the birds come and eat it. The fourth soil is the healthy soil. It's the soil ready to receive the seed or ready to receive the gospel. It's the good soil. What we tend to overlook are the soils in the middle. And this is what Jesus speaks. He says, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on the ground, and they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun arose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them out. However, other seed fell on good soil. Now his disciples, like us, are incredibly dense, and they have no idea what this actually means. And many of us will pretend like we understand what these things mean, but we rarely do. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, the disciples asked, this is the the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures for a while when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, and that person immediately falls away. So trouble and persecution comes on this seed, and there's a little bit of growth, but not enough to really mature. Verse 22, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke out the word and yields nothing. Cares literally means anxieties and worries. It's the cares, it's the anxiety, it's the stuff that's in the world. And what happens is there's an allurement. It literally means a deception or deceitfulness that comes in. And it chokes out, it suffocates the growth that God is intending for each and every one of our lives. The growth never matures. Now, this is a prime illustration opportunity. Thank you, Nick, for getting this. So, for a lot of us, when we talk about soil in our life, what we tend to focus on is, as we focus on these main two, is we focus on the weeds in our life. Weeds. We can know exactly what Jesus is implying. It's the sin in our life. It's our addiction issues, and we'll throw them out. It's our fighting with our spouse, and we'll throw it out. Give me another sin issue we deal with. Y'all you know, went out. You're, you're afraid. You're like, oh, that's mine. I don't want to say mine. <laughs> Pornography, addiction. There we go. What else? Money. Okay, yeah, spending too much. Gotta, I got to be a wise steward with what I give. We got some pride, some pride stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about business here in a minute. Covetousness. That was a, that was a deep one. Uh, wanting what other people have. Let's, let's just call it that one. So we're good at identifying weeds, but what happens is our Christian maturity and growth stops there. Our goal is sin management in modern Christianity. And that's not spiritual growth. See, no one goes in their backyard and says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to clear out every stinking weed. And they go and they clear out the weeds, and they're like, now what? We're just going to wait. What comes back? More weeds. 
You have to plant something in its place. But we all know that if you plant seed in soil that's not healthy or soil that has too many rocks in place, the roots won't get anywhere. And what we have to learn to identify is what are the rocks of hurry and busyness underneath the surface? But the problem is, so many of us have not allowed Jesus to fill those places in our life. These rocks of hurry and busyness are actually part of the foundation of our life we built our life on. See, there's an unearthing that needs to take place. We need to search through the soil and get a part of the dirty work of discipleship. And let me tell you this. You're never meant to search through the soil on your own. If you're going to seek out on a journey of losing yourself, again, capture this, of ungrounding yourself, don't get stuck doing it on its own. How many have ever done a job in your backyard by yourself and thought, this is way too big for me? We've all done it. You've taken on something that's more than you can do. That's the journey of purification of the soul, sanctification of the soul. We have one called the Holy Spirit who's our guide and our teacher, and you have the body of Christ that's called your community that's here for your spiritual family to help you bear these heavy burdens. We asked some, some friends here, my friend Natalie sent out a text to different people and said, what are the main things that produce hurriness and busyness in your life? Here's a list that they gave. Do we have that list of hurry and busyness? Better hurry. <laughs> right now. Overcommitment, overstimulation, work obligations, family obligations, lack of sleep, lack of organization, lack of focus, procrastination. How many are guilty out there? We know it's there. Household tasks, errands, appointments, other people's expectations, personal ambition, worldly focus. Again, a lot of these are symptoms of things that only Jesus can fulfill inside. And that's a journey of discovery that only you can go on. And ask this question, what's that motivation of success? Now, for some of us here, there's some other rocks underneath the surface. And I made my own list here. What are the rocks that occupy our time? Social media. You need to dig that rock. It's not called to be a part of your foundation of your life. It can't be a part of the foundation of your life. It can't be where your identity is found. Empty entertainment, procrastination, disorganization, people-pleasing, drama, we are addicted to drama, so we actually avoid the own issues in our own heart. Celebrity gossip, competitive sports, goodness me, our time schedules. We're trying to make these kids pro athletes at seven years old. I heard someone say, well, I'm paying for their college education now. Just pay for their college education. We burn our whole life away, practice after practice. Let sports be fun, not an early elementary occupation. It's never meant to be that. Competitive sports and video games. Now, here's the deal. When you look at this list, you're like, not all those things are bad. That's true. But the, however, for growth to happen in your life, you got to unearth the rocks. We all know a good garden has decorations in it. And what happens is you can unearth rocks from underneath the surface that prevent growth, but they look really good above the soil. Decorative. We all know that if you have a backyard with too many rocks on top, it just looks ugly. Pick a few things to decorate your life with, but don't make it the foundation you build your life on. Pick a few rocks. Pick a few hobbies. Do a few things. I'm not saying eliminate all video games from your life. Limit the time you engage in them with. Set parameters. Put other things in place. I remember when I was addicted to fantasy football several years ago. I said, I'm not going to check my phone until I've had a significant time in prayer and study. And guess what? It drove me to study more. <laughs> it drove me to pray more. One last element here before our friends from China share. We all know that once you remove the rocks and you remove the weeds and you plant the seed, soil in and of itself needs help for maturity and growth to take place. And what's that key element? Does anybody know what that key element is? Water is true. Yes. Nutrients are good. It's fertilizer, my friends. And we've all been victims of this before. We plant seeds, we plant soil, we don't bring fertilizer in our life. And everyone knows good fertilizer is made from the stuff in your life. 
For us to experience the growth in our life is artificial fertilizers will not produce the growth that God's intended. The best fertilizers, ask Pastor Mark, are organic fertilizers. They come from stuff we don't want to talk about right now. <laughs> for you to receive the growth that God's intended in your life, it's time for you to start mining up all the unprocessed stuff from your life and allow it to be growth agents in your life. Allow the unprocessed trauma, the sin issues that you had now had freedom in, let that process be fertilizer for growth in your life. And I guarantee you'll see the year that God's intended, unprecedented growth. We have to make room in our life. And my question this morning is, what are those rocks that are underneath the surface? I can't name those, only you can. Secondly, what's the trauma? What's the stuff that you need to process so God can actually produce the growth of the gospel in your life? Let's make this year a year of unprecedented breakthrough with unprecedented work underneath the surface of our heart.